Good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of BRS, the Belgian Raiffeisen Foundation. I wish you all a warm welcome to this edition number 17 of the microfinance lunch break. Again, a large and diverse audience indicating that these lunch breaks are appreciated and encouraging for us. The aim of the microfinance lunch breaks indeed is to raise the awareness and to increase the interest for the challenging world of microfinance and microinsurance. ADA, Febelfin, Asurania, KBC and Sera are strong and loyal partners. They are convinced of the important role microfinance and microinsurance play and have to play in the future. They all are fostering this initiative very actively. I especially would like to thank ABC, our valued structural partner of BRS, for their support and generous hospitality for our microfinance lunch breaks. We kicked off the first edition of this microfinance lunch break in February 2009. And since then, through a number of well-known and experienced speakers in review, we discussed a variety of issues of the world of microfinance and microinsurance. And so we are here again today with the new and undoubtedly fascinating subject of the world of microinsurance, the holy grail of microinsurance, voluntary take-up. Most countries in sub-Saharan Africa are unable to grow insurance markets beyond group or bundled microinsurance products. This presentation looks at why this is the case and how it undermines the contribution of insurance markets for households businesses and governments. It explores how the latest wave of technological innovation is helping to overcome this challenge and how it can best apply it to support the voluntary take-up of microinsurance products. After almost two decades of focus on the under and uninsured, microinsurance delivery has proven to be very difficult. Certainly, getting to the stage of diversified retail and voluntary take-up appears very challenging. The research from Senfri, the Center for Financial Regulation and Inclusion, a non-profit think tank based in Cape Town, South Africa, shows five main challenges in insurance delivery in emerging markets, and Senfri looked at how technology can address these challenges. Dubel Chamberlain, our keynote speaker today is the founder and managing director of Senfri. He has extensive experience in microinsurance, anti-money laundering and combating the finance of terrorism, distribution of financial services and regulatory framework design. He has worked extensively across the developing world, including Africa, Latin America, South Asia and Southeast Asia. He is also the chairperson of the governing board of the Microinsurance Network. His colleague, David Saunders, is an engagement manager at Senfri, leading their knowledge management activities. In this role, he is responsible for bringing together and packaging Senfri's work in financial inclusion, supporting projects across Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and Latin America. He has worked with Senfri's research teams to produce and share knowledge generated through Senfri's Making Access Possible Diagnostic Program, the Insights to Impact Data Facility, and Microinsurance and Retail Payments thematic work. So, ladies and gentlemen, once again, we have a challenging subject, fascinating speakers. Together with you, I'm looking forward to Dubell's and David's presentation. Afterwards, as usual, there will be a questions and answers session, followed by closing remarks by Dirk van Limt, CEO of ADD, an independent risk manager and insurance broker within the KBC Group. But before giving the floor to our honorable speakers, I would like to take this opportunity to make some publicity for BRS Microfinance Coop, our cooperative in which you can subscribe as a private shareholder and help sustainably improve the quality of life of poorer people in the South. This can now be done online more easily, and you will find some info on the tables during lunchtime. One practical issue, for security reasons, may I ask you to stay within the KBC premises during this event and during lunch. And now it's high time for our first speaker, Mr. Chamberlain, the floor is yours.
Good morning. I did not have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one. Um, you may know that Winston Churchill is uh, accredited for saying that in one of his letters. Uh, because it's so much harder to package your insights into a short letter, and we often err on just saying everything then. So David and my challenge today uh, is to give you the short letter. And we will do it by talking about voluntary insurance. And we'll break our heart to not tell you everything else we want to tell you. Because there are so many interesting facets about the risks that consumers face, the context of the markets in which insurance needs to operate, and everything else that we are curious about. But we've picked this one because we think it is particularly important for the long-term development of a healthy insurance market that contributes to development. So I will tell you a little bit about why risk matters, why voluntary insurance could matter for risk management, and what the market context is within which insurance develops. David will then step in to talk about some examples of technology and how it is showing the possibility of unlocking voluntary insurance. So, Senfri's interest is in the financial sector. Our broader interest is in unlocking economic development. We do that across the world, but with a particular interest and presence in Africa. So, we always try and take the broader context into account. We are not proponents of trying to develop the insurance sector per se. We are trying to solve risk challenges, and we think the insurance sector has a role to play. But we're also quite cognizant of the fact that insurance can't solve all problems. And even in some cases where insurance technically is able to solve a problem, there are many human and country factors that undermines the ability of insurance to do that. And that's the space that we try and operate in to try and show market opportunity and to identify the issues that need to be smoothed out to help that market development. In most of the countries that we work with, and from the issues we'll put on the table, you'll hear that um, the issues we need to address are often beyond individual companies. Uh, they, we need to collaborate across private sector and regulator, often across different parts of the private sector. Um, the donors have a role to play in some of this. Some of it is beyond the ability of one country to resolve. So we think there's still a lot of work that requires a longer-term view, because these are difficult issues to resolve and a collaborative approach. And that's why we have been a strong member of the microinsurance network and agree with that as a coordination platform, its critical role to bring these various parts together. The other part that I may have to tell you is that in the donor world, there are different types of activities. Our work fits into what could be called making markets work for the poor. And you would identify them often by inclusive finance inclusive economies, inclusive growth. It's an attempt to use the market mechanism to deliver development benefits instead of direct interventions. Now, that has a promise of huge benefits that could be perpetuated through the market instrument, but it is also a really difficult, difficult instrument to wield because we can only nudge, shape, and harass the private sector or regulators to follow a particular course, but we don't control them. And therefore, we also feel accountable for often the very poor performance of products or regulatory frameworks and the way it then does not serve consumer interests. But that's a tension that we think is important to hold. We don't see insurance as a tool that solves all the problems that we're interested in. And now I realize I don't have the clicker. Which one do I click? Green one. Green one. So in the interest of telling you three, three or four snapshots, the first one, the key message is that risk matters. Risk matters in emerging markets, and it matters to low-income consumers. And I think to just illustrate that with a snapshot from Zambia out of a national survey, the point here is that the, um, the main risks that consumers acknowledge they face and the percentage of adults that face them. On the left-hand side, illness in the household, more than 50% of adults reported that they have faced that in the last year. Death of a family member, just more of 30%. Crop failures, just more than 30%, reflecting that the agrarian nature of the economy. And then loss of income, uh, household income for other reasons. 
So these are pretty big percentages of people facing these risks. Some of these risks are technically insurable, but from a viability perspective, they are big challenges. So they may meet the definition of insurance, but we just can't do it in a cost-effective manner in many cases. So insurance can't solve all these problems. The other part that you actually could see from this slide is at the bottom, the key tells you what are the coping mechanisms that those people who said, I face this risk, have used to manage it. And it goes from savings, credit, selling an asset, reducing your expenditure, insurance, doing nothing because you couldn't, you just had to cope with it, or something else. And I think the main point here is insurance is marked in red. I don't think you can see any red, right? Insurance is not there. So we've helped you a little bit by showing you the figure there. 0.3% of people said they used insurance to manage a health expenditure, and less on the others. So risk matters. Insurance don't yet matter to these people, and there are great challenges in, in making it matter. The second one is, you know, as people cope with these mechanisms, they do the things that we've said there, but they also turn to informal mechanisms of managing uh, the risk. So here we turn to South Africa, which is arguably quite a sophisticated market. If you don't know, South Africa has had the highest insurance penetration in the world for a long time. The world, right? And that's because of the idiosyncrasies of South Africa. But we still have a really large, low-income and vulnerable population. So when you look at people who have insurance in South Africa and look at where they get it from, by far the dominant category is a burial society. Now, a burial society is an informal mutual where people come together on a monthly basis to contribute to risk management, and it's often for a funeral. This actually misstates the level of informality, because if you look down the list, uh, through my church, a funeral home, a funeral parlor or an undertaker, much of that is actually also informal. Not, uh, not through a society, perhaps, but through an unregulated party offering them some kind of insurance mechanism. So the point is that many people still rely on, on informal mechanisms. Now, the first takeaway from that is that people actually spend money on managing risk, and they spend quite a lot of money. Um, we can show you some of the discussions we've had with uh, individuals in this group in South Africa where they spend sometimes a third of their monthly income on multiple policies to manage this risk that they're facing. Taking a formal policy, an informal policy, and you know, one from a funeral parlor as well, just to be safe that they covered all their bets and to have enough resources to cope with that eventuality. What we can also clearly say is that need which the risk slide could show you, does not translate into demand. And that's a big differentiator. And what we are trying to figure out is how we make this jump between clearly a need for risk management into demand for insurance. And that's why we're particularly interested in the voluntary take-up, which expresses demand. Um, the informal sector outperforms the formal in a number of fronts that I think is interesting to consider. On the one hand, it's a social aggregator. So you come together periodically because it knits your community together. That's hard for a commercial entity to replicate. Mutuals, more formal mutuals, have means of doing that, but it is quite specific to the uh, type of society that we deal with. The second one is that when you spend one dollar, let's say, every month contributing to your burial society, you manage multiple risks. You don't just manage your life insurance or your asset insurance or going to the doctor. Because they are quite flexible. Because they know each other, they can manage moral hazard and adverse selection and all those things in conversation. So that your one dollar actually covers multiple risks. Sometimes they give you a loan, they don't give you a payout but they will actually lend you the money to send your child to the doctor or to pay for school fees out of the reserves that they've built up. And that is something that the insurance sector have had great difficulty in doing because from actuarial principles, you need to narrow down and contractually limit the risk for which you receive a premium and not let these things flow across each other. Um, so that's a very difficult part for insurers to get around. The second one is, they bend the rules of insurability. 
So in many of these cases, you would argue that that's not an insurable risk. But somehow, through the community mechanism, they can do that. So these are reasons why informality will persist for quite some time. And again, we're thinking about how technology can solve that. And we will not be talking about that specifically today, but one of the interesting examples we've used in the past is Tung Jubao from China, where a person-to-person -person insurance mechanism have evolved that looks and smells a lot like these informal mechanisms in the way that they work and in the way that they can manage insurability. So we think there are some interesting, if somewhat more exotic ideas that can even help us formalize some of these informal mechanisms or make them stronger and more resilient. So when we think about the question of voluntary insurance, there's two sides to the equation. The one is the consumer side, and the other one is the business case side. If I add up some of the things I've said now about the insurance side, the decision whether to take insurance or to take the risk is not binary. You don't go from zero to one. There's factors that make you more inclined to take insurance or factors that make you less inclined to insurance. And that's what this little heuristic is trying to show you. So if you're above the line, you take insurance. If you're below the line, you take the risk. And there are various factors that we think make you more or less inclined to, take, um, uh, to move up and down that scale. Ultimately, it's a balance between the perceived uh, value, very importantly, the perceived value of insurance versus the perceived and opportunity cost. And on the perceived value, it often relates to your awareness of insurance, your understanding of the product, um, so it's necessary to have an, an active outbound engagement with consumers to raise awareness for them, to bring them to the point where they may consider taking insurance. What we've seen also uh, in the past is that some insurance products work very well. So this is 50 Rand, not much worth in, in, in uh, euros at the moment. But if I leave it here and I say that's 10 years from now, and I talk to a customer in year one or year zero, and, ask, and I ask them to buy an insurance policy that will give them 50 rands in 10 years' time. They will find it very difficult to be sure that that 50 rand is actually going to get them what they need. And they will, they will over-discount. So that means that they will value the 50 rand today much greater than the 50 rand in the future. And therefore, they won't be willing to put money aside to get that future. But if instead I told them, if I can find it, we will fix your phone, or we will replace your phone, or we will give you a funeral. It doesn't matter to them whether it's one year, two years, three years, it's actually tangible, and the value doesn't change. Now there's a risk, sometimes that value actually changes. The quality of the funeral deteriorates, that needs to be managed as a separate issue. But from a consumer perspective, tangibility really matters. And tangibility often comes from what you want to do with the insurance. I don't want risk cover. I want to have a funeral, a dignified funeral for my father when he passes away. I don't want risk cover. I want my cell phone repaired. And that is a kind of derived demand that we talk about. And you'll hear a little bit about that in the conversation uh, uh, on the models that David will talk about. The other part is, in this conversation of 10 years and the promise we make as insurers in the future, we sell it to them now and we don't see them again. And if it's life insurance, you see them never again because you, you know, only claim, they claim when you pass away. So the concept of in-life benefits has proven really useful to build a relationship with consumers and to make the insurer present in the lives of the insurers, in the, in, in, in the insured life. The Brazilians are fantastic at this. They were the ones that actually did much of this initially by, for example, offering you health discounts with your health policy or your life policy, which is used multiple times a month, relevant to the risk that they want to address, but really valuable immediately and in real economic terms to the consumer. So these, these, these concepts of attaching the risk management to something that the consumer actually wants, the service, the result, the product that they want, the in-life benefits, 
And using this to overcome discounting, we think are pretty important factors to get insurers to, in, in, in the insured population to understand the policy and to take it up um, on a voluntary basis. We also said relevant risk management, and I think I've made the point already that in, uh, the low-income consumer does not think about risk transfer. They don't acquire funeral insurance. They often go to the funeral parlor the first time when somebody passed away unexpectedly, and they deal, have to deal with the consequences. And then the person tells them, well, if you come to me in future and give me $1 a month, then when your pa father passes away, we can provide for it. And that's how they then access the insurance mechanism, often without fully comprehending or understanding that. And through all this behavior, this uh, frequent interactions, the demonstrated effect to the consumer that this thing is actually giving me value, we build trust in a less mysterious way, because we often think trust is something that arrives by some mystical form. That's actually mechanically just showing that you do what you promise to do. And we think that behavior, that in-life tangible benefit, is a key part of doing that. Of course, the brand value and all those things matter as well. On the cost side, I'm going to spend less time, but it's just to acknowledge that the $1 that the consumer needs to pay for an insurance product is worth more than $1. Because if they have a deficit budget, they can't meet all their expenditure this month. They're choosing not to spend it on something else. And that means that it's worth more. Um, so we do, shouldn't just think of the price, but the space within the budget that it consumes and the opportunity cost of not consuming those other parts. The second important part is that the cost of the premium is often what we look at, but there are, there's a lot of transaction cost for the consumer to access the product, not just the premium. If there's a, 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 not a good payment mechanism, sometimes they have to travel and incur those costs. They have to take off time from work. There's all kinds of um, other costs that makes it expensive for them. And we think all these factors weigh together in the ability of uh, the insurer to create and convey a product that is clearly and perceivably valued by the consumer and can lead to voluntary take-up. So that gives you a bit of the consumer angle that we bring into this equation. Um, this is the last slide before I hand over to David. And it just takes, it zooms out and it reflects another heuristic, so it's not a scientific curve that I'm showing you. It's, uh, we've actually plotted this, and there are people who've done research on this that says it's, it's rigorous, but it's not, you know, it's not a scientific tool. To explain how insurance sectors develop, because we said, on the one hand, we have the consumer side to consider to achieve voluntary take-up, and on the business side, we have business model challenges. And with this, we like to argue that there's a lot of context to which business models could work at what stage. So in the first stage, um, the nascent stage, you often have a very small or almost non-existent insurance sector. And there are still countries with a very, very small or, or absent domestic insurance industry. And the first step is usually around a mine or some other big industry to get a foreign insurer to come in and do corporate asset insurance. There's no distribution infrastructure, very small team, it's often largely offshore the risk. That's stage uh, one. Stage two is when those guys are starting to look then to diversify their business and you start getting into retail activity. But it's done based on groups and compulsion. So in the traditional world, it will typically be mortgage insurance on the back of a credit, a mortgage credit, or compulsory third-party vehicle insurance um, that is sold through a fuel levy or perhaps a little bit further, employee benefits, where uh, it's comp it's, uh, it's, uh, in some cases uh, the employer is compelled to take out certain types of insurance. In the microinsurance space, it was very interesting to observe that much of what we call microinsurance actually falls into that category. So initially it was all compulsory credit life, and we started off 10 years ago, 15 years ago, lamenting the fact that 95% of policies out there are compulsory created life and it pays less than 10% claims ratio and it generally was considered as not good value, to put it mildly. The next generation, uh, so we talked about all kinds of innovation. 
during that time. But the next big thing, which you're all very familiar with, is the mobile, which dominated the last decade. And what did we do with mobile? We started off with loyalty and freemium products, which are not taken up really by the choice of the consumer, but uh, auto-enrolled by the, uh, the mobile network operator to achieve loyalty for their, um, uh, their airtime use. Um, so what happens in that compulsory stage is that we often see, again, there's poor value. And in some cases, mobile network operators actually have paid lower claims ratios than their credit life counterparts. Now, there are some that do better and others that do worse. But the interesting incentive of these compulsory models is that they don't deliver value to the consumer often. And they don't give you the space to design products for the consumer. Because in a mobile insurance product, you're, as an insurer, really competing against ringtones as a means of getting your clients, the MNO clients, to be loyal, which is much simpler for the, the MNO to understand and much easier to turn on and off. So they would want the minimum level of insurance that shows a demonstrable impact on the revenue generated from a user. They're not interested in looking at the needs of that consumer and figuring out how best can we serve those needs. So, this stage two is um, a very important part, and it's one that we argue you need to go through, and you, you shouldn't get rid of, but you need to get the right directional incentives for all these models to start offering better value and being touch points um, to intermediate insurance. Stage three is when we start doing voluntary insurance. And it's maybe limited, it's often life or funeral that starts and it's smaller groups or individuals. And there's a big gap between stage two and three, which I'll come to now. Stage four is when you have a diversified product offering. A retail asset insurance comes in, a variety of life products, term products come in. And we are trying to see whether technology can get us to move to stage three quicker. So why do we bother about voluntary insurance? Because voluntary insurance allows us to, on a cost-effective commercial basis, reach out to individual or small groups of consumers with a wider variety of products that actually meet their needs and not the needs of the intermediary, and with all the checks and balances in place to ensure value delivery to those individuals. Why does this not happen from the business case side? Well, between stage two and three, there is a bit of a Chinese wall, a big wall, in stage two, you have a head office business. You sell uh, your product to one MNO or one credit provider. You don't have to intermediate it to many individual consumers. It's often just based on the capital. You don't have to collect premiums because it's either a single payment from the intermediary or they intermediate it for you because they collect payments on behalf. Um, the moment you move into stage three, you have to convince people to take up your product. That takes a lot of engagement. You need to have people who can have that conversation and all the tools for outreach across your country, not just in the urban center. You need to staff a distributed operation with, with uh, offices in different locations where there's hugely constrained skills and capacity within the insurance industry, typically. And you need to overcome this critical problem of payments because you need to collect from people on a distributed basis and in a cost-effective manner. So we don't think it's a simple equation. And often, it doesn't make sense for those insurance with old systems, costly systems, to actually do this. So when we think about technology, we think it could have two types of impact. In stage two, we think technology can help us to deliver better value to consumers, better communicating to them, tailoring products better to them, and David will, will share a bit more about that. But it can also help us to move to stage three by giving us lower cost communication mechanisms, data about consumers that uh, allows us to identify and price new risks. Um, and it allows us to communicate with people in the way that uh, gives them the best chance to take up uh, these products. So this is the kind of snapshot that you would find within Sub-Saharan Africa. We have a particularly constrained environment, right? So if you have the, the insurance uh, uh, spaces in the emerging world, it's no secret that Sub-Saharan Africa is probably the most challenging. 
and there are uh, products and in inventions that work elsewhere that we've struggled to make work. So the, the case here is that we need to make stage two work. We need to make sure that we pay those claims because that's the way that we build trust. Remember, the ability to claim and having heard that claims are paid is a key part of building trust with consumers. And we need to play that longer term game and it is likely going to be a slightly longer term game of figuring out the models of opening up voluntary distribution. And that's where I'm going to hand over to David to talk about the voluntary distribution models or some of the examples that speaks to some of these facets. So thank you, thank you to Bell. Um, there's always a risk in, in going second because the first presenter sometimes takes your best ideas and your time. Um, but I think, Deval, thank you very much for introducing the concept of voluntary insurance and the insurance uh, decision uh, the for the consumer, which I'm going to speak to now. So good afternoon, everybody. I mean, as, uh, as I was introduced, my name's David Saunders. I'm a knowledge manager at Senfree. And the big one. Okay. <laughs> and over um, the last few years, as we've been understanding the importance of voluntary insurance in unlocking insurance market development, we've been looking at models that uh, we can use as demonstration cases that other insurers can learn from and try to mimic. So I'm going to speak about four models now. Um, three of them are based in sub-Saharan Africa. One of them is based in China. Uh, and they each have um, different elements of what Tabel was speaking about before, around how their business models are tapping into those drivers of voluntary insurance take up. So the first one I'm gonna to talk to is Bima Doctor. So I think, is, is everyone in the room familiar with Bima? I don't know, they might have come and presented previously here. Okay, I'm guessing that, that maybe not then. Well, Bima is one of the mobile enabled microinsurance um, uh, providers that Tabel was speaking about earlier. And they operate across South America, um, Asia, and Africa. And over the last three years, they've registered more than one million clients onto their mobile microinsurance schemes. And they've done this, really, as Isabel was talking about, by building outbound capacity. So they don't just sell the product over, mo the, over the mobile phone. The way that they've sold the product is by building their own agent sales force in a number of these countries. And they've complemented that agent sales force also with outbound call centers. So this gets back to the point that DeBell was speaking about in his presentation around active sales and really trying to build that trust and engagement with the consumer. But I'm gonna talk about a different product that they've recently launched in Ghana that reflects more of what DeBell was speaking about around those drivers of voluntary take up. And this is called Bima Doctor. And it's really, as it says here, about enabling voluntary low cost healthcare in Ghana. And as you can see from this slide, only one of the components of the product actually deals with insurance. And this is something that we think reflects what we're seeing in consumer behavior, which is this demand for tangible benefits, but also improved risk management. So the way that Beam a Doctor works is that the, health, the, the hospital cash insurance is almost the last bit that happens after you get sick. What they really want to try to do is prevent people from getting sick in the first place. And when people are concerned about whether or not they have an illness, provide them with access to uh, doctors and also to healthcare that can help them with that. And that reflects, I think, what you guys saw in that, that first slide that DeBell presented, which one is that one of the most relevant risks in sub-Saharan Africa, and Ghana is no exception, is illness in the household. And it's also figuring out the different tools that individuals need to use in order to manage those risks. So for BEMA Doctor, the reason we're following it is we're interested to see how they're using tangible benefits and risk management, how they're leveraging the mobile phone to reduce the cost of accessing and using their services. So not just accessing, um, not just in terms of premium payments, but also uh, accessing healthcare professionals. So this next model that I don't know how many people are familiar with as well is called Zongan Online. So Zong'an is an insurance company in China. And to give you an idea, over the last three years, they've underwritten 5.8 billion policies for more than 500 million consumers. And so we put this up here because I think that we want to show is what the potential of digital and technology can achieve. But we also realize that in the markets that we often work in, in sub-Saharan Africa, it still is a long way away. 
but there are things that we can learn from this model that can potentially be replicated. So Zong'en was established by three of the large technology firms in China, Alibaba, Tencent, and Ping'an Insurance. And by establishing Zong'en, or, or investing in them, they also partnered with Zong'en, which gave them access to hundreds of millions of consumers, and, as Sabelle was saying, the data and information on those consumers. And what we've seen is that Zong'en has been able to insert itself into the operations of its partners to provide relevant insurance products for their consumers. So oftentimes, Debell was talking about something called derived demand. So you go to buy a product, and then insurance can be added on top of that. Well, in the case of Zong'en, um, one of their major partners is Alibaba, an e-commerce platform in China. And one of the major frustrations that consumers have with Alibaba, and Alibaba has with consumers, is the returns. So one of the most successful products that Zong'en has launched in the last three years is return insurance, that you can basically top up when you're buying a product, so it's integrated directly into that consumer behavior already. One of the other very interesting products that they've done, again, this concept of derived demand and relevant risks, is flight delay insurance. So one of the largest growing sectors in China over the last five years has been domestic flights. And so Zong'an has partnered with one of the travel groups that organizes a number of these domestic flights in order to provide flight delay insurance. And then one of the third, fast, another uh, very fast-growing sector in China um, that's a little bit more controversial is their peer-to-peer -peer lending model. And there's been a lot of concerns about the exposure of their peer-to-peer -peer lending market. Zong has also partnered with a number of peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms as well to try to underwrite or ensure some of that risk associated with it. So they've really tried to figure out where are the relevant risks that we can fit into. And the second thing is, where is the existing transactions that consumers are already undertaking in which insurance can enhance? And we think that's one of the major reasons that they've been successful. But I think that at the same time, China is quite unique. It has significantly higher number of adults that are using digital technologies already to, make, to, to buy and sell goods and services, which makes them, I think, more comfortable with that process. So the payments mechanisms are already used that uh, Zongyan can also piggyback off of. And then the last bit is really around this idea of the data and information. I mean, I think a number of us in this room are familiar with Amazon's um, outbound capacity which it doesn't really feel like they're actively selling you something, but what they're doing is they're using data and information to build a profile of you and what you'd be most likely to buy and then target you in what seems like a passive way. Well, an example of how Zong An does this in China is they look at weather patterns on the day of flights. And what they look at is which flights have the highest likelihood that they're going to be delayed. Then they look at consumer profiles of who's been delayed most frequently and they try to target those individuals literally on the day with whether or not they want to buy that product. So it's a new way of kind of building outbound capacity through the use of data and information. Now, in sub-Saharan Africa, we also have seen the emergence of digital platforms. So um, the organization that Debell and I work for, Senfri, has recently conducted a study on platforms in sub-Saharan Africa across eight countries. And in those eight countries, what was interesting for us was that there's over 300 digital platforms already emerging. The largest digital platform or e digital platform is e-commerce platform in Africa, and it's Jumia. And Jumia is like the Alibaba of Africa, but it has a lot, uh, a number of uh, challenges that it has to overcome that the Chinese environment benefited from. So they have, I think in 2017 or last year, they crossed the a billion um, visitors mark to their website. They now offer five million products. So the point of that is that they have huge, they have large scale in Africa, but still the majority of their transactions happen in cash. So AXA has partnered with Jumia, as you can see here, to offer direct sales of insurance products. And as Sabelle was saying, the device insurance. You know, it's a tangible thing that people can experience. But the jury's still out on how successful Jumia will be with these direct sales because it's really just introducing a new channel, and in many cases, a number of consumers in, in Sub-Saharan Africa might not be using this e-commerce platform, or if they are, they might be using it for very low-cost goods. So what we've now seen Jumia doing is starting to follow the, the, the Zong'an model, particularly in Kenya, where they recently announced a similar type of cover that Zong'an offers to Alibaba, uh, to consumers of Alibaba good. So in, 
in three months you want to return your good, they partnered with an insurance company, and they'll completely refund that good for you or sell you a new one. And what they're really trying to do is insurance is trying to fit in to an existing transaction that consumers have with these platforms and help to support a problem that both the consumer and business have. And I think that's a really important part about ensuring that the risks that we underwrite um, trying to tap into this market are relevant and also leveraging off of that derived demand that DeBell was speaking about earlier. You're already buying a good. It's an easy thing to put on top of. So the last model that I want to talk about, actually, I always say has technology in the background. So if you looked at that first slide that DeBell put, or the second slide DeBell put up on where you get insurance from, or funeral insurance from in South Africa, you saw at the very bottom it said sports club. So in South Africa, Hollard, which is the largest private insurance company, partnered with the largest football club, Kaiser Chiefs, um, which is the largest football club not just in South Africa, but in sub-Saharan Africa, to sell funeral insurance. And the way that they went about it was to build physical stores close to the communities in which they wanted to sell. Now, that's an extremely difficult proposition because oftentimes you're thinking the, inc the, the insurance premiums are not going to justify that. Well, what they found was that they broke even in the first year of insurance sales because by getting closer into the community, they reduced the cost to the consumer of accessing and using their services. On top of that, the funeral insurance product that they offer isn't just something that only covers you after you die. Like DeBell said, they provide in-life benefits as well. So what we're trying to see here is that there's a number of different models that are starting to show promise in terms of voluntary take-up that are using technology in different ways. So this, what I mean by technology in the background for Hollard is that you don't see technology when you go into the store, but all of the origination of policies, all of the claim servicing, that's happening in the back end, which they're using their own digital platforms for. Zong N, which we kind of held up at the beginning, is kind of the most extreme case of where they're using technology and digital to solve the most number of challenges with driving voluntary microinsurance. Whereas we're still waiting to see how a platform like Jumia can be used in sub-Saharan Africa, and whether the success of scale in mobile insurance can be leveraged in order to start targeting consumers with voluntary insurance. And I think what we're most excited about, or why we're starting to be maybe optimistic, but not overly optimistic, is we're seeing technology and data is really enabling new types of active sales or outbound capacity. So the example of Zong An being able to use data and information to target someone more actively. But the other side of it is you can't skip the value component. So one of the major challenges that mobile microinsurance had in sub-Saharan Africa was that they offered products that consumers weren't always aware they had, or if they did have, they didn't always see the value that they got in comparison to what they got from informal alternatives. So what we really want to emphasize is that value, while technology and data are going to unlock new opportunities, it's that value that's still going to be extremely critical in product design. So I'm going to hand it back over now to DeBell to do the final key messages. So I think David has actually touched on many of these. I don't have to read this out for you. I think what we try to convey to you in our short letter is that risks are relevant. Many of them seem insurable, but difficult to do viably. Those risk needs don't translate into demand for insurance for various reasons, but also because of the behavior of consumers. We know now from behavioral economics that there are many good things we know we should do that we don't do. So even if we acknowledge that we have a big need, we are bad at actually managing that. What I also showed you is that in terms of the market development curve, it is likely a difficult and a longer term journey to build this voluntary space, but it really is the space in which the business case for the insurer comes to, uh, comes to right. Because in stage two, particularly in the microinsurance case, it's really small cover with small premium. It's not gonna push premiums to a great deal. The development case in stage two is quite strong. Even those small bits of cover to individuals are more than they would ever have gotten elsewhere. And if we can just make, the, the, the pay, the, make them to pay claims, actually the development case is big. But the immediate business case for a traditional insurer is difficult. Highly expensive cost structures is usual, and they don't have the ability to innovate easily. So we are thinking some of these technology companies should probably get a bigger space to play 
uh, because they actually can and want to do that. But in stage three, that's where the diversity of products, the types of premiums that uh, makes it more interesting to the insurance industry comes to play. What we do in stage two will determine how fast we get to stage three, and that's why we are trying to explore whether there are ways in expediting that journey and trying to get insurers to take that longer-term view and not avoid claims in the short term because it may make sense from a financial perspective, but undermine your marketability. And then we looked at technology and, and started to hint at that there are facets of technology that address aspects of both the consumer and the business side. And it makes it plausible that we can solve some of these problems. But we found within the development space and microinsurance specifically that having a plausible solution is far from getting an implemented solution because the incentives to implement those solutions often is not there to implement it in the countries and the markets that we want to. So if we leave it to itself, we don't think it's going to get there or near, not nearly as fast as we would like it to. And that's why we work with regulators to avoid any possible regulatory problems, to create certainty for companies to innovate, to not predetermine business models, but also to some degree get out of the way uh, in some cases for business to operate. And we're trying to work with companies to demonstrate that there is a future business case. There is a business case currently, but the real business case comes if we do the business well along the way. And that these technologies make for very interesting new assignments. Um, the, the examples that, that David noted showed how these companies could conceive of new products for new risks and insert them into relationships with clients in a way that actually addresses both the risk need, but also the behavioral issues of them to try and take up that product. So I think that's, that's the message we want to leave with you, is that uh, there are plausible technologies that can take us there, but we need to work on those incentives, regulatory and otherwise, to get them to solve some of the emerging market and low-income problems that we would like to solve. Thank you very much. Okay, I would like to thank uh, Dubel and David very much for the interesting presentation. Um, we have some time left for Q&A. Um, we received some questions in advance, so um, I'll start with one of those, and after that, uh, we'll, we'll go to the audience. Um, so uh, one question, uh, Dubel and David, um, is um, you talked about how technology could possibly help um, in, um, uh, in going to the next stage and in the, in the business model. Uh, but if we look at the relationship between um, uh, clients and technology, uh, then the question is, um, and specifically for low-income clients um, and low-income people, um, is it possible for them to stay up to date and follow the rhythm of technologi uh, technological innovations? Um, and don't we expect too much of them? Yeah, so I, I think that's a legitimate concern, and I think it does depend on the specific market that you're dealing with. The case in Latin America is very different to the case in Asia and the case in Africa. Uh, what we do see is that consumers have adopted technologies which are quite complex when it meets their needs. If you think about the, the, mobile, the basic mobile phone usage, consumers have been using, using USSD codes to execute fairly complex payments and transactions. Now, I don't know if, ever, if you ever try to use, use USD codes, but that's not a simple system. You need to remember lots of codes and stitch them together in an interesting way. So, on the one hand, we see that low-income consumers adapt to these technologies when they derive value um, and they can perceive value from it. I guess the other point that David made was that with these platforms, they are emerging across Africa across uh, um, low and higher income African countries, and they are achieving take-up. The Jumio numbers are in the millions. So that may not be the uh, poorest of the poor, but then you must also know that in sub-Saharan Africa, I think it's 90% of people earn less than $10 a day. So almost everybody is in a low income and vulnerable proposition. So those kind of numbers already reach low income consumers. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dubel. Um, we'll go to the audience now. Uh, we have two great assistants going around with microphones. Um, so if you have a question, please, please raise your hand. Hi, Dubel. This is Bert um, from uh, Microinsurance Master, Microinsurance Leadership Program. It's great to have you and, uh, and David here in Brussels. 
and thank you for the great presentation. My question is that um, you focus a lot on technology for the growth of microinsurance. And my experience as well with the partners I'm working with, like Pioneer, but also others like the Holler that you referred to, is that it also is a, has, comes down a lot to the right attitudes. Um, insurance are very often also in um, emerging economies incumbents that work in a traditional way of, um, a way of delivering insurance with a traditional mindset, procedures, apologies, etc. And a lot comes down to really to be able to give a space to innovate, to reach these new clients they don't know yet. And it comes, uh, looks very similar to a startup where you need to um, test things out, uh, measure and learn from there. And that can be done, um, and I think Hollard and Pioneer are great examples as well, without necessarily going into the route of technology. And I was interested in your view on that. Yeah, so there's, there's two elements there. The one is the promise of technology, and the other one is the challenge of uh, who's going to adopt that technology in the country that we want them to, for the market we're interested in. So the point you make is very valid. That stage two wall that I talk about, I, would, I think that's part of the reason why the existing industry is fairly lethargic and not incentivized to move. If you look, we've just recently looked at Ghana. Average uh, expense ratios are more than 60%. Combined ratios more than 100%, right? For them to offer low income products, it's just impossible. And they make a relatively limited returns from which they need to invest a lot of money to get the technology, which their shareholders probably don't want because they still make a little bit of money, right? So there are big problems with the incumbents. And what we also find is that regulators have inadvertently built up the wall around those incumbents. So we see regulatory standards capital requirements, fit and proper standards in sub-Saharan Africa multiply for no, good re no, no apparent reason. There is, it's not based on risk perception or actual risk measured. It's based on a notion of complying with international standards and professionalization. So all of these factors are building a wall and creating a club, which is not healthy. So we have been known to have tough talks with the insurers and telling them that they're asleep at the wheel. Um, and that they are delegating their clients to other parties who will control them in the future, like these intermediaries. But ultimately, we think to get that perspective to change, you need to create a credible threat of competition, which there isn't uh, a lot of on our continent, because the regulators are quite concerned about these, uh, often many insurers only cannibalistically competing for the existing market and undercutting each other, that they think they have to make them less. So they raise the standards to make them less. But in that way, they actually prevent competition from coming in. So we are actually controversially saying, if the third party administrator is the one that leads the business in more than two thirds of these mobile uh, offerings, offerings, right? Because that's the case. They lead the design, they do the administration, they do the product development, then they should be given the regulatory space to lead uh, the initiative and not be subject to the incumbents in that space. You still have to underwrite and do that, but you can structure it in a way that they can lead that. So that part is very much a key part for us around getting the incentives to get this technology applied in the right place. We then still think that these technologies then hold the value and can overcome some of the challenges to achieving that take-up that we want, to, uh, uh, we want to achieve. Okay, thank you very much, Dubel. Uh, we have time for one last question before the closing remarks. I look around. No more questions? Okay, yep. Yeah, you spoke about Africa, yeah. but you are also working in Latin America and Asia, but I didn't see any case about it. recent activities, and that's where the, the challenges that we uh, co conveyed are the most pressing. Um, so there's very different experiences in the different markets. If, for example, if you look at Latin America, the level of innovation is quite high. Um, they use all kinds of interesting aggregators, like utility companies. The brokers play a very strong role. Uh, to some degree, they play the role that third-party administrators play in Africa. They design the product, they do the data analytics, and they match big retailers with insurers or utility companies with insurers. 
And uh, there, we didn't talk about, the technology wasn't the headline when we spoke about innovation in Brazil, but it was certainly present. It was agent-based banking for payments or mobile payments. It was uh, sophisticated uh, data an analysis for clients, which the brokers could use utility company data for, for example. So some of these similar things occur there. But income levels are substantially higher on average in Latin America, and the business infrastructure is much stronger. So you have huge franchised retailers and big government schemes and utility companies, which gives you reasonably easy access, even if it is at a price, right? So the classic statement in Brazil, in Brazil was insurance belongs to the distribution channel. Microinsurance belongs to the distribution channel. And we were told that the retailers can charge you multiple million dollars just to start the conversation about their clients because they know they control the client base. In Asia, there are many other models, you know, from, from pawnbroking to the co-ops um, that start working there. But again, the, um, the BIMA and the microinsurer technology, uh, the models running on mobile, is, is relevant there. And as you would see, the platforms actually find it easier within the, um, within the Chinese context to extend. So there's lots of things we can tell you about those markets, but I guess the African one makes, the, uh, makes for the hardest business. So that's where we're trying to, uh, to see whether technology can get us beyond that. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the questions and thank you again, Dubel, for the presentation and uh, the answers. Thanks. So for the final closing remarks, I would like to introduce uh, Derek van Liemt. Uh, Derek, uh, uh, like Frank already said, is the CEO of um, ADD, um, uh, an uh, independent uh, insurance broker, uh, part of the KBC group. Uh, but uh, Derek was also, um, uh, as a volunteer, uh, an advisor for one of our microinsurance projects uh, from BRS. So uh, the floor is yours, Derek. Thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, I'm a freelance volunteer. Uh, I'm very inexperienced and I'm still very young, so maybe I make some mistakes, but nevertheless, I'm giving it a try. So thanks to Bell and David for your great presentation. And what a title you chose. The Holy Grail of Microinsurance, Voluntary Take-Up. What a title, really. Um, I give much importance to films, and the first thing I reflect on is the Holy Grail of Monty Python, but also The Last Crusade uh, with Indiana Jones. This is my generation, so... But in the end, really, what are we searching for, for the microinsurance? What are we searching for BRS? This is the Holy Grail, and this can help us. And um, InsurTech will help us in this, uh, and that is what your presentation was about. Uh, you explained us several things, several techniques, the BIMA uh, application. I look, took a look, look at it yesterday on my mobile. It's really fantastic. It's really straightforward. You can see everything, the Jumia thing. Um, and I'm even more convinced because I um, experienced very recently that the whole industry, the whole insurance industry is working on it. And so maybe today disruption and InsurTech will find each other. Um, only two weeks ago, uh, I was present at a presentation by a certain Stefan Vreken, um, which was organized by AXA. And this was about InsurTech, an index-based uh, insurance blockchain. And it will com completely change our industry. This was had to do with solutions for uh, crop failure or heavy weather issues and things like that. It would be... Um, reduce costs enormously, would be simplify the thing, really. And last week, as an ADD member, we are a member of the WBN organization, which is a, the largest world organization for independent brokers, for corporate insurance. And there it was all about InsurTech. CNA, which is a really world carrier, was presenting cases against with index-based uh, insurance, and they were bringing in solutions, or they're preparing solutions. And there will be coming the power and the money available to even broaden this thing. And that's what we're searching of. And let's also be realistic. Also, our own group, KBC, we have now in the EXCO a person who is responsible for as a chief innovation officer. So again, the whole industry is working on it. And 
that is very promising, and it will also evolve towards BRS. Because for me, the most relevant thing is that these um, techniques and approaches will break down the barriers between the stage two and three that you explained. Um, because it will make it, it possible that it gives us, us uh, resources, that it gives us money to do other things. Because again, BRS is working for the lower end of the population. We want to make them less vulnerable towards uh, poverty and all that kind of stuff. And let's be realistic, today, and even in insurance solutions, but also probably in microfinance, there's still lots of uh, losses towards costs, transaction costs, as you explained. It can be up to 20% and even more, but also distribution costs that we see. In some cases, it goes to 30 to 50% what I experienced in Nicaragua last, uh, at the beginning of this year. So uh, with these techniques, techniques, we can lower these things and we can make available resources for the communities. So we work on the community thing and then we can work on prevention and make them, again, uh, more self-sufficient and less uh, vulnerable. And this will really be the holy grail, to my view, and, uh, and it is very close because the power and the money is coming out from the big business, so it will come available. And that's an interesting thing. Um, so, and then maybe some, those who know me very well know that I regularly refer to somebody who spoke about, I have a dream. So maybe it's not only the holy grail we're talking about, but maybe we might become uh, again in the paradise like it was there for like centuries ago. And that would be only the real dream that we can really want to have. So these were my uh, comments on this presentation. Now um, I want to thank you all. And it's uh, an honor for me that I can invite you towards uh, the reception and the walking dinner, which is just outside to the left. Thank you.